I am glad to see all of you here in person this morning, and certainly those of you that are online. I'm Pastor Reggie, for those of you that don't know, and, uh, and then particularly for those folks that are, are, are on here in person and are planning to come back, uh, please know that uh, even in light of uh, the governor's changes in terms of the state of Texas requirements, we are still maintaining the same protocol moving forward. Uh, we're going to continue to evaluate where we are, but our protocol and everything that we've been doing throughout this pandemic is not changing, at least not right now. So we thank you for, for being uh, faithful to that, and we ask that you would continue to do so, and we will all get through this together. I do pray that you had a great week last week, uh, and that you're really getting into our Lenten study. I got to be honest with you that, you know, I, I think I try to walk around. I try to get up every day. I, I try to get up on the right side of the bed. I try to get up being thankful for just being able to wake up. Amen. And, and I try to get up basically in a good frame of mind. And I got to be honest, though, uh, Amy will tell you, it doesn't always work that way. Amen? See, she's saying that's right. <laughs> but, I, but I do try, and, and I look, and I, I'll have to be honest with you. Sometimes, like this week was not the, better, the best week for me for my life, just in terms of where I was. But you know what? That's when I think God sends you a message that is directly for you. As I was preparing this message, I started writing things and I would read some stuff about it and then get into it. And I was like saying, dang, this is for me. <laughs> and as I'm writing something else, what well, I'm writing for you and I'm writing for you. And I'm like saying, I don't know if all of y'all getting anything out of this or will, but I am. It's actually speaking to me. So the whole concept of the red letter challenge and everything that we've been doing allows us to truly flesh out some meaning of these words for Jesus, these concepts that Jesus is presenting to us. If you're new to worshiping with us, whether in person or online, you know, you can still do this. We are fo focusing together in this study. And if you would like to know what that means and you want a, a book, we can still provide one for you. We can give you information because we want folks to be engaged. You know, as we talked about in, in these two weeks, that one of the ideas behind this is that Jesus focused on really five things most of the time in the Bible, five things that he emphasizes over and over and over again. Being, forgiving, serving, giving, and going. So we still want to invite you to enjoy and join us as today we talk about serving. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the, the, just the touch that you place on our lives. Even when we don't, we don't, we, we may not even be ready for it. We, we may not even know it's there, but yet, God, you basically awaken us to, to new things, to, to new things that we can understand and enjoy and embrace about this purpose that you have for us. So God, we thank you for this challenge that you have laid down before us so that we can truly be the people you have called us to be. That's all we want, just to be the people you've called us to be. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. You know, many of you remember the devastation that was caused by Hurricane Katrina. Uh, several years ago. In fact, many of you were actually here in this part of this worshiping community and how it pretty much destroyed New Orleans and a, a lot of the area in Louisiana. And this was an unprecedented storm in terms of the damage that it created and it left a lot of people without shelter and a lot of, without food and without water and without clothing. And, and what I'm reminded of is the response that this church made during that time to decide to open a shelter for people that were, at least some of the people that were displaced, and how as a church we came together to provide food and clothing and, and comfort and even social services for folks. And, and this went on for several months. And it was such an outpouring of love and such an outpouring of service to people who were affected that we didn't even know. You know, I remember that the, the volunteer list that we had to serve, uh, and, and we pretty much ran this thing like 24-7. And, and the volunteer list was never exhausted. There were always names on it. In fact, there were names not only from people in this church, but there were folks within our community that wanted to come here to actually serve because they saw the benefit that it was doing in terms of what it was doing to help these people. One of the interesting conversations that took place 
before we even opened the shelter was that we had talked about our plans and the folks who run the city, the city manager, the fire chief, the police chief, and the EMS director and others had asked, when they heard about this, they asked Laurie Sai, who was our missions director at the time, and me to come and meet with them to talk about this. And I remember as we went to meet with them and we kind of laid out our plans on what we were gonna do, I remember someone in that meeting asked the question, and I don't remember who it was, but they said, why are you doing this? He said, why are you doing this? And I remember pausing, and I looked at them, and I turned and looked at Laurie, and I looked back at them, and I said, because this is what God's people do. <laughs> and I remember thinking at the time, that was an interesting question. Why are you looking to help people? Why are you looking to serve? Why are you looking to be the hands and feet of Christ for people? Because this is what God's people do. <laughs> Isn't it what God's people do? Am I wrong? <laughs> this is what God's people do. That was our reason. That was our motivation. And for us, it was so simple. We believed it was also the motivation for many of the people that came here to work, to tirelessly provide, tirelessly provide these basic necessities for folks. People who, through no fault of their own, were left with nothing. Some of them came here with just the clothes on their backs. But to commit to do this, it meant we were going to have to work. It meant that we might have to displace some of the stuff that we were doing, or we might have to move some stuff around, and we did that. It was going to mean that people were going to have to devote a lot of time and energy and comfort and love to people who needed it, because that's what you do when lives become uprooted. And yet, for all those people who tirelessly supported this and worked hard and did this, this was a totally natural response. This is what you do. You see, when it comes to serving God, the motivation behind what you do is more important than what you do. You know, as I began this series discussing being and, and Pastor Thea preached last week about forgiving, this week we move into serving. And the reason we are focusing so intently on these words, these red letters of Jesus, is because we understand that motivation. We are motivated to live our lives according to the calling that Jesus has placed upon us and because of all that he has done for us. Shake your head. That's right, that's what we are motivated to do. He's taught us, he's healed us, he's served us, and he's loved us so much that he gave his life for us. And because of all of that and more, when we actually stop and think about who we are, think about who we are and what we're called to do, our love of Jesus should make us want to be the greatest followers of Jesus that we could ever be. So inside of all of us, I want you to know something. Inside of everybody, we actually like the idea of serving. We really do. It's something that resonates with us, even if it isn't something that may naturally come to us. Serving others can be one of those things that will give you the greatest amount of fulfillment. And if, if you're anything like me, though, there may be things that you've agreed to do, service projects or going somewhere to do something, and, and, the, and the closer you got to it, you may have begun to wonder, why did I decide to do this? <laughs> I mean, you know, particularly after the week I've just gone through, or, or particularly the fact that it's, it's on a Saturday, and Saturdays are the only days I get to do whatever I want to do. You know, particularly since I didn't even stop to think how much time this was going to take to do this and how much prep time I was going to even have to put into it. So now I'm starting to wonder and even doubt myself, why did I decide to do this? But you know, I found that even when I had those thoughts, and I've had those thoughts, I'm not going to lie to you. But even when I've had those thoughts, after I did what I committed to do, and after I went and did that, I found I actually enjoyed doing it, and I got a sense of warmth and a purpose and of joy after doing something that I was to do to serve people. And forgot all about those thoughts about why I decided to do it. It showed me why I decided to do it. 
because somebody was getting help. That's how you get fulfilled. That's what serving does for you. Now, let me tell you why that is. Our scripture passage today is taken from John 4, 27 through 36, and I want to set up the scene for you. We find Jesus at this beginning, before this passage, he's talking with a woman at a well. This is a Samaritan woman. This is a woman who was from a different culture, and then this was a culture that Jews did not associate with. And, And of course, you can well imagine, if you know anything about Jesus, we find him doing normal, what he normally did as his ministry on earth. Jesus went against the grain a lot, amen? So he's going against the grain. He's breaking all sorts of cultural barriers. He's, he's a Jew. He's reaching out to a Samaritan. He's a man, and he's publicly speaking to a woman. Now think about your life. You may feel you really truly want to do the right thing, but sometimes it may be tough for us to go against the grain, to break down those cultural barriers or other barriers that provide us comfort that we need just to live in our own skin. You know, sometimes we don't want to bother anybody because we just don't want to be bothered. (laughs) Amen? Okay, I'm the only one. You know, if we find ourselves in a place at a well or any other place where there's something going on and people are different from us or there's a situation that we need to address, we find a way just to keep moving, just to keep going. But not Jesus. Not Jesus. Jesus breaks those boundaries. In this particular situation, what he did, he wants this woman to know the truth, and he wants her to know what salvation is, and he offers her not just water, but living water, living water. He talks to her about her religion, and you know, initially she responds like any of us may have responded. She comes back at Jesus strong. She basically says, no, I've got my own ideas about this. But then Jesus continues to talk to her, and he pulls out some dirty laundry from her own life. And she's wondering, how does he know all of this? How does he know about me? How does he know all the things that I've gone through in life? And she realizes that this man is for real. He must be the Messiah. He must be the one that is coming that is able to offer this living water to all of us. See, this is such an awesome depiction of Jesus' ministry because he was so often out there looking to save the lost. And, and, And it's an awesome picture of what God's heart is to save every human being. But our focus today is actually moving beyond that, moving beyond that interaction of this woman to the interaction of what happens when the disciples return. So the next scene plays out in Scripture like this. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you could know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, I don't know about you, but I love scripture that talks about food. I I do. Maybe maybe you don't know this about me, but I love to eat. (laughs) I do. 
I, I love to eat. In fact, I think many of you, having heard me talk about my love of eating, probably even know what my favorite foods are, amen? Because it's not like I don't talk about them all the time. And I do, in fact, I, I bet you if, you if you're online, if you, you could put some stuff in the chat right now, you could tell everybody what my favorite food is, because you know. And you also sometimes know what the stuff I don't like is, my least favorite foods. Although I gotta admit, I, I think it's, it may be an oxymoron for someone that likes to eat as much as I do to have a least favorite food. <laughs> Doesn't make a whole lot of sense sometimes. But I will tell you this, if you think about the disciples as they got back to where Jesus was, after they'd probably eaten their lunch and they'd been filled and they're probably getting ready to take that afternoon nap, they see Jesus and somebody's probably thinking, oh, didn't anybody bring Jesus anything to eat? Jesus, it's getting late. Uh, you need to eat something. We ate. You need to eat too. You know, eating is important to us, and, and not just for nourishment. I, I, I would imagine that if we ate just for nourishment, we would probably all eat healthier and eat a lot less. But we eat because we enjoy it, amen? <laughs> We like to eat. We enjoy feeding and, and that desire to consuming food and that feeling that we get after we consume food, particularly food that we crave. You know, we live in a culture that understands consumption, to be filled, to be satisfied. E eating makes us feel better. Th this is something we understand, and, and our physical bodies need to be filled, and that makes us happy. Happy. I know you got your mask on, but I know you're smiling under those masks right now <laughs> because it makes us happy. But, but there's something else I need you to know. Your souls also need to be fed. And one of the ways to feed your souls is by serving others, serving, helping people, pouring into the lives of others is the sustenance, the nourishment that feeds your soul. You know, in this passage, when the disciples were worried about what Jesus had to eat, he told them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. We find Jesus here, he's not worrying about eating or feeding his body. We find him less focused on consuming and more focused on contributing. And I believe that what Jesus is telling us today is that we have greater fulfillment in contribution than we do in consumption. Nod your heads. Amen. See, if Jesus is wired to feel revitalized and re-energized by contributing, we're made in the image of God, so we must be wired that same way. This is what he is telling us. We are made to serve. He made us to serve. You need to serve people as much as the people you may be serving need you. You know, in these red letters, Jesus is telling us that serving God, doing God's will is his food. People are serving that we do is not only to fulfill our souls, it is about saving souls. It's about saving souls and the people don't think they're not out there. The folks are out there. Folks, they are there, and, and, and they're waiting for us to spread the gospel. Jesus even tells us, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. You know, true worship of God in spirit and in truth, it necessarily flows out from this sowing and reaping and this eternal harvest of folks that are reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. You know, this isn't just a mission that Jesus gives us, for, or gives his immediate disciples. He has given that mission to all of us, to all of us. This is about serving God's people, about helping God's people, about pouring our lives. John likes to use that word pouring. I like that word because John uses it, pouring your life into people. This is what we do. This is about reaping a harvest, a harvest for eternal life. You know, every Christian should have a place of service. Every Christian should have a place of service. Every one of us should jump on opportunities to serve people in the kingdom, 
to serve God's people. It's a part of who we are. It's our calling. It's a fabric. It's in our DNA. It's food for our soul, but we also do it for the sake of other souls. See, if you don't have a place where you're committed to serve, if you don't have a place where you know that if you weren't there, it wouldn't happen, if you don't have a place where you know by going there, you are making a difference, I invite you to find one. To find one. This is your chance. This is your moment. This is your opportunity to create fulfillment, not only in your life, but in the lives of others. This is your opportunity to do the work that God calls us to do. There's all kinds of opportunities here at this church. You see people doing that all the time. I, I don't know if you see the number of people that actually may speak to you or maybe leading people or leading kids or doing all those things. All those folks are not on the church staff. Those are folks that are actually working to serve. In fact, the church staff is here to serve them, to truly allow folks to basically manifest that ability to serve one another. There's all kind of opportunities here, but let's just be honest. There's opportunities everywhere. You know, let's just be honest though. Sometimes we may get so inundated with requests to serve something that it may become easier to fold our tents and to begin repeating that well-worn phrase, well, let's just let somebody else do it. But I'm telling you, the time we're spending trying not to do things, the time that you may spend to ignore the needs that may be in front of us, your souls are starving. Your souls are starving. Are, they're not being fed. They're being unfulfilled. And, and we're walking around wondering why. There's just too many opportunities to serve one another, to help, to actually take care of this gigantic harvest that we have to nourish people and to nourish ourselves and to take care of this opportunity we have to feed the needs of God's people. We should embrace this desire to feed our souls because this is what God's people do. Being servants is a part of our identity in Christ. When people serve people, we're not just thinking about Jesus, but, but we're thinking about what he did for us, and we're actually stepping into that new identity that God gives us. Serving others gives us joy because we serve folks out of that identity. We fulfill our God-given purpose. When there is a need, we respond. When there is a call, we answer. When help is required, we let people know help is on the way. You know, I, I spoke earlier of in the event that happened in Louisiana and how we responded to it to, to help people in our, another community out of a devastating situation. But let me share something with you that happened just a couple of weeks ago. You know, some time ago, we got a random call at our Redeemer campus from an elderly lady. She lived in Manville on a piece of land and she lived alone and she was fairly isolated. She's in her 80s. She's basically blind, and she needed help. And, and she, she was calling the church, the church, asking for help, basically begging for help. She, was, she cried on the voicemail that she left. And so when we got this message, folks responded to it. A, a couple of people from the Redeemer campus actually went out there to visit with her, and, and thanks to their patience and their persistence and the serving heart that they had, she's getting some help. Food was purchased for her, and, and support was given, and, and she was assisted getting to and from some appointments that she had. And she was let, they let her know that we care for you. You're not forgotten. You're not forgotten. But here's the part I really wanted to share. You know, during this ice storm that we just experienced, folks were worried about her. And early on, she said she was doing okay. She didn't really need any help, didn't want any help. But a few days later, two of the guys from the church just went over there to see how she was doing, and they found things in a really bad place. She had lost power. She didn't have any heat. 
she was starting to get frostbitten. She hadn't eaten in a few days. But most concerning, when, when her power came back on, she had a pipe that had burst in her home, and there was water coming out of the electric sockets, and there was smoke coming out of one of the outlets. And they got her out of there. They, somebody took her to one of their own homes, and, and quite frankly, they saved her from probably a much worse situation. And you know what? This is pretty incredible. But as anybody that's around here in the church office at any point during the week, you will know we get these kind of calls all the time. We get people requesting help all the time. And as a church, folks, you know who you are. We respond. We respond to this stuff. I'm sure you're familiar with wheelchair ramps and, and small repairs that we've done on properties. And, and you're, you're familiar with food pantries that we've stocked here and, and meals that we provide and, and phone calls that we make to lonely and isolated people. And the time that we would take just to pray with people because they want to be prayed with and they want someone to know that they're not alone. And as proud as this makes me, and it makes me so proud for all these times that we respond, I don't think anybody is doing any of this to make me proud. I don't think that's the reason. I don't think you're serving and the things you do is not even to make your own name great. We serve because we recognize what Jesus Christ has done in our lives, amen? We serve because we want to glorify God the Father and experience the greatest fulfillment this side of heaven. We contribute, we serve, because by living a life, we live a life that's bigger than ourselves. You know, I don't know about you. I am so grateful, so grateful for what Jesus has done in my life, for what Jesus does every day in my life. I'm glad that I have, just like this week, I get a reminder that no matter what goes on, this ain't about me. <laughs> it ain't about you either. It's about all that we can do to serve God's people to feed our souls. I, I work to follow Jesus, to lead others to Jesus, and to change the world. And I do this because I know that Jesus thought so much of me that he left all these wonderful teachings and these examples to invite us into this relationship with him and with our God in heaven. And he does the same thing for all of us, which is why if you don't know who Jesus is in your life or needs to be in your life, you can always contact us. Text the word CONNECT to the church office to 281-485-1466. We'll help you along with this path because we know how important it is to feed your soul, to feed your soul. You may think your soul's not hungry, but if you read those letters, those red letters, you will realize your soul is actually starving and needs to be fed. I want to close today with this powerful scripture passage from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, 5 through 11, as I believe it tells us so much about who Jesus is and who he calls us to be. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven on, and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray.
Lord, we do thank you that as we acknowledge your presence in our lives, we recognize that our souls are starving, that we truly need to be fed. So, Lord, allow us to take advantage of those opportunities that, that will feed our souls, that will serve others. And we would truly recognize that a relationship with you is the greatest thing that we could ever desire and ever achieve. Lord, we know the opportunities to bring in that harvest to all around us. Allow us to quit taking a blind eye to the needs and to truly focus intently on all of those things that we can do to glorify you. It is in the holy and precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen.